Okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, it feels a great honor to be uh, giving the final talk at this wonderful conference. Um, for me, it seems very appropriate that uh, the meeting is in Italy because actually it was in Italy in uh, Villa Gualino in the late 80s that I first uh, met Boris and uh, was certainly a very exciting time then to uh, actually see in the flesh uh, him and other people whose uh, papers I'd been reading. Um, all through this week, I've uh, regretted the fact that uh, we didn't take any photographs back then, so I can't uh, show any uh, images from, from good old times. Uh, so I just have the memories. Um, so the uh, topic which I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, not really to do with nanoscience or, or mesoscopics, uh, it's a topic in uh, statistical physics. Uh, there is a sense in which you can argue that it's a kind of distant cousin of uh, things that uh, we know and love in uh, mesoscopic physics, and the uh, argument goes like this. Um, one of the surprising things, perhaps, in mesoscopic physics is that at uh, the lowest energy scales on the uh, energy scale smaller than the Thales energy, uh, even though uh, the geometry of a sample is completely irrelevant, there's still lots of interesting physics, for example, in uh, level statistics. And the problem that I want to talk about is uh, one that involves very long length scales where the uh, details of the uh, system are unimportant, but uh, nevertheless there's um, interesting probability distributions for the quantities that that we're looking at. Um, so uh, I, I want to talk about uh, statistical problems where you have uh, a, a kind of soup of, of loops. And uh, the specific question is uh, what the length distribution is uh, of these uh, loops, uh, particularly the long ones where uh, there's a chance of something uh, universal. So this was work in collaboration. And the specific part that I'm going to talk about is really just uh, one aspect which I've picked out from uh, a much larger body of work. Um, So this is a, a cartoon of the kind of problem that uh, I want to think about. Uh, so uh, we have a, a situation which I'll talk about more in a minute that uh, gives us uh, some statistical ensemble of, of random curves. And uh, there are basically two ingredients. So one is some local rule which tells us how uh, different uh, pieces of these uh, curves linked together to form loops. And the other ingredient which you might have is the possibility to cover e color each loop uh, one of n possible colors. And this is a little bit like uh, a number of components for, uh, for a spin in a, a spin problem. Um, so problems of this kind come up in all sorts of contexts. I'm really mostly interested in what happens in three dimensions, but let me start with a picture in two dimensions. So if you want to define some ensemble of uh, random loops in uh, two dimensions, you can start with uh, a smooth uh, random uh, scalar function and say that your curves will simply be the uh, zero lines of the scalar field. And uh, in other words, uh, take them to be uh, the boundaries or hulls of percolation clusters. So in two dimensions, if we do that, uh, in most circumstances, we'll find that the loops have a maximum characteristic size. But we also know that uh, by tuning the random potential so that the percolation threshold is at zero energy, uh, we can make this uh, size uh, diverge. When we go to three dimensions, we have the possibility of uh, two distinct phases. 
So one way of uh, getting random curves in three dimensions is simply to generalize the two-dimensional problem. And of course, to have uh, lines as zeros of a random function in three dimensions, we need to take it to be a random two-component field. So uh, for instance, a, a random complex field. Uh, and then uh, as we go around one of these zero lines, uh, the uh, phase of the uh, field will wind by 2 pi. So uh, again, uh, we can control the um, length of the loops by uh, varying the average of the random two-component field uh, with the, uh, compared to the magnitude of the fluctuations. So if the average is large and the fluctuations are small, uh, most of the zero lines will correspond to short loops. But on the other hand, if you, for instance, tune the average to zero, then uh, generically what happens is that some fraction of the strands of these loops lie on curves which extend right through the sample, and it's actually those extended curves uh, that I want to uh, talk about in, in this talk. So there are all sorts of situations where people have studied uh, random curves like this. So for example, people are thinking about cosmic strings, did quite a lot of numerical simulations to uh, determine things like the uh, fractal dimension of uh, random curves. Uh, we learned yesterday afternoon that uh, cosmic strings can be uh, excluded by uh, observations now. Uh, but fortunately, there are other situations. Uh, for instance, if your random uh, two-component field is uh, an optical field, then uh, you can have vortices in it. If you have a liquid crystal, then uh, the disclinations in three dimensions uh, form uh, closed loops. Uh, and then one example which is maybe closest to mesoscopics, if we think about uh, a complex uh, random wave function, so uh, an eigenstate in the system with uh, broken time reversal symmetry, uh, then its nodes uh, again uh, form an ensemble of uh, random loops. Um, another place in quantum mechanics where uh, curves uh, random curves come is if we think about the uh, Feynman path integral for a Bose gas uh, in imaginary time. And uh, then, of course, one of the rules is that we should think about uh, trajectories of particles which take us from some in initial configuration at time zero to some permutation of that uh, configuration uh, at imaginary time one over t. And to relate that to loops, I can uh, project along the uh, imaginary time direction uh, and uh, draw these uh, trajectories in the uh, space dimensions. And uh, if I'm at high temperatures so that the imaginary time uh, direction is short, then uh, these trajectories will typically either return to the same particle uh, after propagation uh, in imaginary time, or maybe uh, correspond to exchanging uh, small numbers of particles. Um, I'm drawing pictures here in two dimensions because that's all I can manage, but really I want to think about a system with three spatial dimensions as well as uh, imaginary time. And then we know that if we make the imaginary time direction long enough, uh, we can have Bose condensation. And in the language of these loops, that corresponds to going from a situation where I have only microscopic loops to uh, one where uh, some macroscopic fraction of the particles uh, belong uh, to uh, extended loops. So the kind of question which you can ask there, and this is the kind of question I want to focus in on is what the distribution of lengths is uh, for these uh, very long loops. Um, so 
this slide is intended to uh, be a bit more specific about the kind of uh, questions I want to probe. So suppose uh, we have some ensemble of random curves and we measure the length of each loop. And so we have a, a total length of, of the loops as a sum. Uh, we can uh, study the uh, distribution of loop lengths. And it's natural to uh, weight this distribution with the length of each loop uh, and normalize it using the total length so that we end up with something which is uh, normalized to 1. And then this distribution function will have uh, really two components to it. If we look at microscopic distances, it turns out that these loops are, are Brownian. And uh, so the probability of return to the origin you can get by thinking about diffusion. And uh, so the loop, uh, the probability distribution of loop lengths uh, decays in d dimensions like length to the power uh, minus d over 2. And this type of behavior you can expect to continue uh, with increasing loop length uh, up to uh, a size of loop length set by the system size, uh, which is simply uh, the loop length that you need to go before uh, discovering that you're in a finite size system. Um, and then uh, uh, at longer distances, uh, well, these are really the macroscopic loops which uh, I want to uh, talk about. And uh, their maximum length extends as far as uh, a size set by the volume of the, the sample. So really the question is, what's the nature of the probability distribution in this regime? And one important point is that you can separate the population of loops into uh, two components, uh, as I'm showing here, because this part of the probability distribution, if we're in more than two dimensions, uh, decays fast enough that its normalized, that, that uh, its integral is finite by itself. Uh, but then the second part of the distribution uh, can make a finite contribution to the normalization uh, because of the very wide range of length scales uh, from L squared to uh, L to the power D. Okay, so this is intended to define the kind of questions that we want to ask. Um, and this is the outline of how I want to talk about uh, answering those questions. So um, first of all, we'd like a, a cleaner definition of the problems we're talking about. and. Uh, convenient way to do that is to define everything on the lattice. Um, but then we'd like to get from there to a field theory. And uh, I'll outline how you do that in two steps. So first of all, you can go from thinking about loops on the lattice to a kind of generalized spin model. And you do that by uh, choosing a spin model which gives you the loops as a high temperature expansion. Um, and then you can use the symmetries of the spin model to identify uh, an appropriate field theory, which is a kind of sigma model. And uh, you can think about loop length moments as uh, observables in the sigma model. And by calculating these moments, uh, you can, in fact, identify the uh, limiting distribution, which turns out to be something known as a Poisson Dirichlet distribution. Uh, which is something I'd never come across before, but uh, is something which is uh, studied a lot by mathematicians. Uh, actually, I've only talked to two physicists so far who were uh, familiar with it uh, already. Uh, one of them was French, and one of them was Russian. So I'm not sure what that tells you about uh, education uh, syllabuses. Um, OK, so to get on with that program, uh, I want to start by defining loops on a lattice. And um, uh, 
we could think about different categories of loop problems, but the simplest one to talk about and the one I'll restrict myself to is one in which the loops are directed. And to get uh, a dense uh, system of loops, we can start with uh, a lattice with directed links and then break the nodes up in such a way that uh, the lattice is decomposed into uh, a set of loops. And um, we'll do it stochastically so that a given node will uh, be separated in one possible way uh, with one probability and in the other possible way with the complementary probability. So obviously there's a great deal of freedom for how we choose our lattice and so on. Uh, I'm going to draw pictures with a kind of Manhattan lattice where uh, we have alternate avenues going north and south and alternate streets going east and west. And uh, then we want to think about what happens as we vary this uh, probability, uh, P, for breaking the nodes up in the uh, two alternative uh, fashions. So uh, at one extreme, if we break the nodes up in the way I've drawn at the top, uh, we decompose the system into a dense set of very short loops. And uh, if we do things in the alternative way, then we just have extended trajectories which run through the system. Uh, but more generally, if we have some intermediate value of P, we'll get some combination of short loops and longer trajectories. And if we do that kind of thing, uh, not in two dimensions, but in three, and we study it on a computer, then uh, we can get a phase diagram like this, which includes transitions between the localized phase and the extended phase, and the transition might either be continuous, which is what this blue line indicates, or first order, which is what the uh, red line indicates. So my focus is what happens when we have these extended loops, and that's what I'll carry on to talk about. Um, so the next job is to get from this lattice model uh, t eventually to a field theory. And um, of course, one feature of loop problems is that the degrees of freedom you have are not local objects, they're extended. And it's much more convenient to uh, have something that's a local object as a starting point. Uh, so n is the number of colors uh, for uh, each loop. So the point is that if you have many different colors that you can associate to each loop, then you have uh, more entropy associated with configurations with uh, more loops, and so you favor short loop phases. Um, so it's, that's why the phase boundary bends in that way. Yes, so um, this, is, this is a crossing point, yeah. but, but the important thing is that there's, uh, they avoid each other at the crossing point. Um, so, no, no. Uh, the, 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 there are only two parameters, this quantity P, to control which, uh, uh, how much of the two kinds of uh, node I have, and then N to control the number of colors. Uh, with regard to colors, yes. Yeah, so the extended phase has um, uh, has at least some fraction of the links on uh, extended loops. Um, 
Okay, so it's not very convenient to deal with these extended objects, uh, loops, and instead we'd like some local variables. And uh, I want to pass over the details of this, but basically you can introduce uh, unit complex vectors on each link and choose some action or Boltzmann weight so that uh, you reproduce the high temperature expansion when you uh, reproduce in the high temperature expansion the loop model uh, when you integrate over the orientations of these vectors. And um, when you go through the details of that, which I'm hiding, uh, you can identify the symmetries of the, the Boltzmann weight or the action that you need, and you can use those symmetries to write down a continuum field theory uh, and then use that continuum the theory for, for calculations. Um, so uh, there are two kinds of uh, symmetries, uh, a global one and a, a local one. Um, and the field theory that you end up with is a sigma model, and the reason for that is that the microscopic variables are fixed length uh, unit vectors. Um, it turns out to be a sigma model on a complex projective space, and that's because the local symmetry tells you that the phase of these uh, complex vectors is irrelevant, and so the field in the sigma model is something that's bilinear in Z and its complex conjugate. And there's uh, uh, a global symmetry which tells you that the sigma model has to involve just uh, gradients of this field. Um, so there's a kind of dictionary between the loop model and this sigma model. So the phase with only short loops corresponds to the disordered phase, the paramagnetic phase of the sigma model. The uh, phase with some uh, loops macroscopic corresponds to the ordered phase. And uh, the fraction of loop length that's in the macroscopic loops uh, corresponds, in fact, to the magnitude of the order parameter in the sigma model. Um, and you could go on with that dictionary, uh, but the uh, entry that's important for us is to do with calculating correlation functions. And the point is that if you insert one of these uh, Q fields into uh, an average, then it tells you that you have a loop of one color with the color fixed by one of the labels on the Q field uh, arriving uh, at the point where the Q field is inserted and a loop of another color leaving that point. So if you, for instance, evaluate a two-point correlation function in uh, this theory, then it tells you about the probability of having a loop which uh, passes through the origin and through the other space point in the uh, expectation value. I'm sorry, I mean, what is the symmetry of the sigma model or many of It's on uh, complex projective space. So, yeah. Yes. Okay, so that way the uh, two-point correlator tells us about the probability of a loop passing through two points, and we can take that further, and if we want the probability of a loop to pass through three points, A, B, and C, then we can calculate that as an expectation of three of these fields with the indices chosen so that the loop has to change color as it goes uh, through the three points. And um, if we want to calculate moments of the loop length distribution, then we simply have to integrate these uh, averages uh, over all positions uh, for, the, for the arguments of the Q fields. Um, and here we have a crucial simplification. Um, if the 
loops that we're focusing on are the very long ones, then we're interested in these averages uh, when the uh, space points are far away from each other. And uh, for those, uh, we can, uh, in the ordered phase, think of the uh, Q matrix as being approximately a constant, and the average that we need to do is simply an orientation over, uh, simply an average over different orientations for the order parameter. So uh, we basically can evaluate moments of the loop length as uh, a kind of zero momentum mode average over directions of the order parameter. So when we do that, we can get results for all of the moments of the loop length distribution, uh, and they involve factorials uh, together with powers of the total length that's in macroscopic loops. So of course, just looking at these moments is not very illuminating, uh, but fortunately, from the moments, you can go back to the probability distribution, and the probability distribution is this one which, uh, as I said, is familiar to mathematicians, known as uh, Poisson Dirichlet distribution. So uh, what I want to do is explain what this Poisson Dirichlet distribution is like, and um, there's a nice uh, construction of it, uh, which is called a stick-breaking construction. So imagine that we start with a stick of unit length, which corresponds to the total length of extended loops in my system. And then uh, I'll break a piece off this stick, and I'll choose the length of the piece that I break off with uh, a certain distribution, which has one parameter in it. And then I'll take the remaining piece of the stick and I'll break a fragment off it, uh, again with the same fraction of the total length as in the first case, and then I'll repeat that process indefinitely. So as I go on, I'll get a sequence of fragments which uh, will tend to be shorter and shorter, uh, although uh, not necessarily uh, at every iteration. Uh, and uh, their total length will add up to the length of the uh, original stick. And um, so what the calculation of uh, loop length moments shows is that um, the lengths of the long loops uh, measured in units of the total length uh, of macroscopic loops uh, have precisely this Poisson Dirichlet distribution, and this distribution contains one parameter, and that parameter is fixed by the uh, number of colors that are available to the uh, loops, so that if that number is large, then you, the distribution is uh, skewed towards uh, shorter loops, whereas if the number is small, then the distribution is skewed towards longer loops. So, Actually, it was quite a surprise to me that one can even write down uh, probability distributions for an infinite number of variables, which are neither simply Gaussians uh, nor uh, so complicated that it's impossible to understand them. Uh, and, and I think uh, this occupies that middle ground. Um, to test these project predictions and maybe think a bit more explicitly uh, about them, uh, it's convenient to go from uh, the whole distribution for an infinite number of loop lengths and uh, integrate out all but one of the variables and to uh, focus in on the length distribution of a single loop. Um, so this is the quantity which I had near the beginning of the talk. And I argued that at short distances, it decays like length to the minus d over 2. Uh, and the question at the beginning of the talk was, what form does it have on longer distances? And this uh, result from the Poisson Dirichlet distribution gives us uh, a specific concrete form uh, that depends on the number of colors. And of course, you can test that in uh, numerical simulations. and these different curves for different values of n 
lie on top of the theory uh, rather precisely. So, to my mind, there's just one question remaining, uh, which is, why is it that we get such a simple and universal distribution in this problem where you might have thought that things like sample geometry, details of boundary conditions, and so on, could all be uh, important. And um, it turns out that there's some very nice intuition that comes from mathematicians, and actually I find the papers by mathematicians in this area quite hard to read, so I don't claim to have uh, a complete listing of the relevant names. Uh, there's certainly one important work that was done by uh, Schramm, the uh, person who also worked on SLE, and I learned a lot by reading reviews written by uh, Daniel Ulechi, who's in the maths department at, at Warwick. Um, so the problems that mathematicians can actually get under control are ones without any of the spatial structure that I've been talking about. So they're ones which we would classify as mean field problems. Um, but to uh, say things about them, the mathematicians have a nice technique, and I think that technique also, at least on the level of physicists, gives us insight also into problems uh, with spatial structure. And the insight comes from adding an extra layer to the problem, which involves uh, introducing some dynamics. So that's to say, we imagine under this dynamics, we can reconnect uh, from one type of node to the other. So if you're doing Monte Carlo simulations on these problems, then this is precisely the Monte Carlo dynamics that you would use. And for instance, if the probabilities of these two alternatives are equal, then uh, you'd expect that you should be able to flip between them um, and uh, leave your loop length distribution uh, statistically invariant. So, of course, if you flip between two nodes, then depending on how they're connected together, it could be that you're taking two short loops and converting uh, them into a single longer loop, or it could be that you're going in the opposite direction. And if you pick a node at random and uh, ask for the probabilities of going in each direction, then clearly uh, those probabilities will depend on what the loop length distribution is in your ensemble, because if there are lots of shorter loops, it's more likely that you'll go to the right, and if there are lots of very long loops, it's more likely that you'll go to the left. So it's clearly a strong constraint on the loop length distribution that it should be stable under these dynamics. And uh, the point about the poisson dirichlet distribution is that it's stable under just these dynamics, which the mathematicians call split merge processes, um, if the probability of the kinds of loops that go through these nodes uh, is determined only by loop length. And uh, clearly, uh, in a problem that's got mean field character, uh, loop length is the only thing that can uh, control the probability of uh, a strand that you pick at random belonging to a loop of a certain length. Um, so if we go beyond mean field problems, the point is that the loops that I'm focusing on are ones which have a length that's uh, long enough to fill the entire volume of the sample, which means that they cross the sample many times which gets you into this mean field regime. Uh, and so maybe the surprise is that in this mean field regime, uh, as in mesoscopics below the Thales energy, we have interesting uh, uh, phenomena still, uh, including in particular this uh, Poisson Dirichlet distribution. So um, that's it. The ideas were that the loop models can be represented by uh, sigma models on 
complex projective space, and uh, we can get the joint probability distribution of lengths for long loops, or at least its moments, by computing these uh, zero momentum averages, these finite dimensional integrals in the sigma model. And the loop length distribution has this very uh, simple uh, form, even though it's a distribution for an infinite number of variables. Uh, and this form is the Poisson-Dirichlet form. Thank you. Yeah.